And on what we call Liberty Island, back then it was still known as Bedloe's Island, they had a full program of speeches. A book of those speeches was published not long after the dedication. And having read it, I think some of those people just like to hear themselves talk. Some of those speeches went on and on. One of the shorter talks was given by the president of the United States, Grover Cleveland. He was there to officially accept the statue as a gift from the people of France. Also on hand was the sculptor, Frederick Bartholdi, the man who designed the statue. And he had a very simple job that day. He was there to unveil the monument. How do you unveil a monument that big? Well, they did not try to hide or cover the entire statue. Instead, just had a large piece of canvas, which was painted red, white, and blue in the pattern of the French flag. And that was suspended by ropes in front of her face. When Bartoldi got a signal from the ground, his job was to cut the ropes and lower the flag. Well, one of those speeches had been going on for a long time. And when the speaker paused, possibly to catch his breath, Bartoldi thought that was his signal. He cut the ropes, down came the flag. That set off about 15 minutes of cheering and applause and naval salutes. It put an end to that speech. Now, the day was supposed to end like any patriotic holiday. They had fireworks prepared, but as you can tell by the painting on the left, the weather was not cooperating and the fireworks were postponed a few days. But it was thinking about that date and especially the year, 1886, that started me looking into the history of the statue. Pretty amazing when you realize the statue alone is 151 feet tall. If you add in the stone pedestal and the concrete foundation, the entire monument, about 302 feet. And okay, that may not sound like much by modern New York City standards. One World Trade Center is 1,776 feet high. But back in the 1880s, nothing else in the city quite that tall. For example, the towers on the Brooklyn Bridge, which had opened just three years earlier in 1883, those are about 276 feet high. The tower on the Brooklyn side of the East River was completed first back in 1875. Tallest building in the city at that time was the steeple of Trinity Church. On Broadway, across from Wall Street, it was built in the 1840s, and that steeple, about 286 feet high. New York did not start to become our modern city of skyscrapers until early in the 20th century. And even some of those early skyscrapers, for example, the Flatiron Building that was finished in 1902, they were a little bit shorter than the statue. So in those years, who would have been thinking of a 300-foot monument? Well, Frederick Bartholdi. He was born in eastern France, a town named Colmar. But he mostly grew up in Paris, where he studied both painting and architecture before finding his real interest in sculpture. And you might even say that the course of his life was set when he was 20 years old. 1856, he joined a group of friends, other painters and sculptors, and they took a nine month tour of Egypt and of the Near East. And like everybody who visits Egypt, they were amazed by the pyramids. But Bartoli was also very interested in the Great Sphinx. And that's really what it would have looked like in his day. By then, the Sphinx was already about 4,000 years old. In those 4,000 years, the desert sands had covered it up to its shoulders. Archaeologists would not finish excavating it until the 1930s. He was also impressed by these statues near the city of Luxor, 64 feet high, carved from quartzite. They're twin statues of an ancient pharaoh, and they're known as the Colossi of Memnon. And Bartholdi would remain fascinated by giant sculptures the rest of his life. Now, to give you just one example, in 1880, he created this giant red sandstone lion. And giant is the right word, 72 feet long, 36 feet high. Carved it in honor of the men who defended a French town called Belfort during the Franco-Prussian War of 1870 and early 1871. The town was held by a small force, and only about a third of those men were trained soldiers, but they held the town for more than 100 days against an army of 40,000. They only stopped fighting when the government in Paris surrendered and ordered them to stand down. When the war began, Bartholdi had enlisted in the French National Guard, for which he made several trips to the port at Bordeaux 
where he met American ships bringing supplies, including guns and ammunition for the French army. But it was way back in 1865 that he had attended a dinner party at the home of a French historian and scholar, Edward de Laboulay, lived near Versailles, taught history and law at the College of France, never visited the United States, but greatly admired our nation and wrote several books about our history, including a three volume political history of the United States. Also translated the autobiography and other writings by Benjamin Franklin for French readers, because Franklin was one of his heroes, a man who at the beginning of the American Revolution sailed to France and helped to convince the king and the government to support our fight for independence. Laboulaye also taught the first French college course about the American Constitution, which he hoped would serve as a model for a later French Constitution. But he only got to teach that class for two years. He introduced it in 1848. In 1850, Louis Napoleon, Napoleon Bonaparte's nephew, he declared himself emperor. That made him Emperor Napoleon III of the Second Empire, and he ruled France for the next 20 years. During those 20 years, Laboulaye restricted himself to teaching ancient history, did not think that a class about the American Constitution would go over very well under the empire. Well, most of the other people at that dinner party were other scholars, historians, writers, politicians, and Bartholdi mostly just listened to the conversation, and they talked about history, about the long friendship between the United States and France. They discussed the American Civil War, which had just ended, Laboulaye was both founder and first president of the French Anti-Slavery anti Society. They mourned the death of Abraham Lincoln, whom they all admired. And then toward the end of the evening, Laboulaye suggested that it was time for our two nations, the United States and France, to work together again. Not to fight the British this time, but to build a monument to freedom, or liberty as they termed it. What sort of monument? No, he didn't say probably hadn't given the matter much thought. 1865, the emperor was still in power, so nobody in France would be building a monument to freedom anytime soon. So Bartholdi, he turned his attention back to Egypt, where the Suez Canal was under construction. When the canal opened in 1869, Bartholdi attended the opening ceremony and presented the ruler of Egypt with a sketch of a statue he had designed and which he hoped could be placed at the entrance of the canal and which would serve as a lighthouse to guide ships in. He called this statue Egypt, carrying the light to Asia. And the light would either have been in the lantern she's holding or in her crown. Well, the ruler of Egypt liked this sketch enough to keep it, but then decided the statue, that would be too expensive to build. So this one never saw the light of day. Would have been much smaller than Liberty. With the pedestal, would have stood about 130 feet high. But that didn't stop newspaper critics years later from accusing Bartholdi of designing a monument for Egypt and then repackaging it as a monument for the United States. Bartholdi always said the two projects were unrelated, and this is the cover of his patent for the Statue of Liberty. So 1871 rolls along. The Franco-Prussian War comes to an end, but Bartholdi doesn't really have a home to go back to. His hometown of Colmar uh, the regions of Alsace and Lorraine, they became part of Germany at the end of that war. France would not recover them until the First World War. Now, he also had a home and a workshop in Paris, but there was a civil war raging in Paris. The emperor had been captured in, in September of 1870. At that time, a new government was set up in Paris, but that's the same government that surrendered early in 1871, which left a bit of a power vacuum. So a radical government called the Commune sprang up, and it would take several months of fighting to drive them from power and to restore some sort of order. While all of this was going on, Bartholdi visited Laboulaye, who was now hard at work at Versailles drafting a new constitution for the French Republic. And Bartholdi said that for the last few years, he had been thinking about visiting the United States, and this seemed like the perfect time. Laboulaye agreed, wrote Bartholdi a letter of introduction, but also gave him an assignment or two. He asked him, while you're traveling about sketching and painting, look for the perfect place to build this monument we discussed. And speak to as many prominent Americans as you can, tell them what we'd like to do, and then come back to us with their reactions. And this is just what Bartoli did. He visited all of our major cities, a lot of smaller ones as well, 
and he was sketching, he was painting. And along the way, he was meeting with businessmen, generals, politicians, famous writers. Up in New England, he met the poet, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. I'm sure you remember the Midnight Ride of Paul Revere or the Song of Hiawatha. He even got to speak to the president, Ulysses S. Grant. Met him down here in New Jersey because Grant had a summer home on the beach in Long Branch. And everybody that Bartholdi spoke with encouraged him to continue working on this monument. Now, he was also looking for the place to build it. But as he wrote years later in a memoir, when he first arrived in New York Harbor, in June of 1871, saw some of the smaller islands below Manhattan, he knew he had found the spot. He would call that harbor thrilling and magnificent. And when he returned to France, painted this watercolor sketch showing how the statue in his mind would look if you placed it on top of a stone pedestal in the middle of the old star-shaped fort out on Bedloe's Island. For the rest of his life, Bartoli would call the place Liberty Island, though the name was not changed officially until the 1950s. So as you can see, he was eager to begin building this statue, but France was still recovering from the war. So he had to wait until 1875, when the French-American Union was established. And this was made up of French business people and wealthy Parisians. They elected Edward de Lavallee as their first president. And in keeping with his idea that both of our nations should contribute to the monument, they decided that the people of France would raise money to build the statue and that they would leave it up to the people of the United States to raise money to build her a pedestal. Neither government was going to put any money into the project. So they held benefit dinners and concerts. They sold souvenirs and lottery tickets, greatly underestimated the cost of the statue. Well, nobody had ever built one quite like this, so they didn't really know what they were getting into. They estimated it would cost the equivalent of a quarter of a million dollars. Even though all the copper they used would be donated by a French metalworking firm, final cost was closer to 400000 or roughly eight million in today's money. But as the donations came in, Bartoli could get to work transforming his drawings into a series of models, including a four foot tall clay model, which he presented for Lavallee's approval. They later made 200 copies of this model out of terracotta. Those were sold as souvenirs to raise additional funds. This one made its way to the United States and is displayed in the museum out on Liberty Island. But here's where things got a little complicated. How do you get from a four foot clay model to a 151 foot statue? Well, what Bartoldi did was carefully measure every detail of that model, more than 1200 points in three dimensions. He then multiplied to find the dimensions to make a larger model. This one made of wood covered with plaster, stood about nine feet tall, still exists. Early in the 20th century, Bartoldi's widow donated that model to a French Museum of Science and Technology, where it's been standing ever since. A few years ago, a French art dealer got permission to scan that model, things being a little easier with today's technology, and then make a dozen bronze copies of it. The first one he donated to the museum, the others were up for sale, if you had a million dollars to spend on one of them. Well, Bartoldi measured every detail of this model as well, multiplied again to build another one of wood covered with plaster four times as tall, about 37 feet. As these models got larger, he could perfect the finer details. And with one more round of measuring and multiplying, he built his final model. This one was full-sized, 151 feet of wood covered with plaster, so big, there was not a workshop in Paris that could hold it, so they had to build the model in four sections. This is actually a model of part of the model. Bartoldi made this himself, and the figures of the workers in there give you a sense of the scale. Now, the purpose of this full-size model, they brought in woodworkers who used it to make a set of wooden molds, one for every part of the statue. Because of course, Liberty was much too big to make in one piece. You were not going to carve this statue from stone or cast it. And even if you did, you'd have to move it from Paris to New York. So the statue would be made from sheets of copper. And teams of metal, worker, metal workers hammered those sheets of copper into the molds to form the skin of the statue. But the copper is pretty thin, only about as thick as two pennies. So there are concerns about it remaining in place or remaining in shape 
once it's hanging in in place and even remaining in shape as it's being shipped overseas. And of course, it will not support its own weight. So as part of the construction process, iron bands were attached to the inside of the copper. Now, when the statue was completed in 1886, there was insulation between the iron and the copper, but the entire structure was designed to flex in the winds. So over the years, that insulation wore away. And when iron and copper come into contact, you have a reaction that causes the iron to begin corroding very quickly. So as part of the restoration process in the 1980s, getting the statue ready for her 100th anniversary, they made duplicates of every piece of the ironwork, made them out of stainless steel this time, and then replaced the old iron one piece at a time. There was a fear that if they removed more than one piece of the iron at a time, it could put too much stress on the old copper. And some of the rusty old iron is still displayed in the museum out on Liberty Island. Now that mold that I showed you a few slides back was used to make some of the toes on her left foot. This is actually a full-size reproduction of the left foot, which is displayed out on the island. If you look closely, you can see how it's made from a number of pieces of copper riveted together. It would take more than 300,000 rivets to assemble this statue. But this was also the original color, what she looked like before all of that copper began turning green which is just a natural reaction between the copper and the harbor air. Didn't harm the copper. In fact, it forms an outer layer that prevents further corrosion, but it did not make Bartholdi very happy. When he passed through New York in the 1890s and saw that the statue was already beginning to turn green, he was disappointed because this meant that the copper would no longer reflect sunlight as well as, well as it originally had. Now he did have a solution, he recommended to our Congress that they cover the entire statue with gold leaf. Yeah, Congress passed on that, although they did later debate painting the statue white so that it would reflect sunlight. Thankfully, they realized that would also be too costly and too difficult to maintain, and they just left the copper alone. Well, that foot is one of two full-size reproductions you can see out there. The other is of her face, and stand anywhere near that, you really feel the size of the monument. Mouth is about three feet wide, eyes two feet, two and a half feet in diameter. Bartholdi said that he modeled the face after his mother. Her name was Charlotte, and she, would, she was widowed when Frederick was only two years old. So she brought him and his older brother, Charles, to Paris, where they grew up. Charles would also study art as a boy, later in life became a lawyer and a magazine editor. But Charlotte did hold on to the old family home in Colmar. They took summer vacations there. And today that house is a Bartholdi museum. But of course, Bartholdi did not start building the statue with that left foot. In fact, the first part he completed was her right hand and torch. And those were finished just in time to appear at the American Centennial Exposition held out in Philadelphia the summer of 1876. They charged admission there, about 50 cents a person, a lot of money in those days but that money would help fund the construction of the statue. After paying admission, you could climb, the, climb a, a ladder through the arm and stand on the little balcony underneath the flame. It held about a dozen people at a time. And if you look very closely, there are a couple of people standing up there in this photograph. And of course, Bartoli would really have liked to have the entire monument finished for 1876 because it's the United States 100th birthday the 100th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence on the 4th of July in 1776, the date he put on the tablet. He used Roman numerals to keep with the classical style of his sculpture. Now, if you visit France, which I have not done, you can see a couple of smaller copies of the statue, one in Paris, another in Bartholdi's hometown. Both stand about 37 feet tall, and they both have two dates on the tablet. The first is July 4, 1776. The second is July 14th, 1789, the day the Bastille prison was stormed during the French Revolution. Now this American Centennial Exposition, this was the first official World's Fair held here in the United States. So you had exhibits from around the nation, from around the world, technology was a big draw, people would line up to see the world's largest steam engine. 
which drove some of the other exhibits. Along with the hand and torch, Bartoldi displayed several statues and a large fountain that was originally lit by a dozen gas lamps. After the exposition closed in the fall, the federal government bought that fountain and moved it to Washington, D.C. Its original home there, as you can see on this old postcard, was on the mall in front of the Capitol. After a few decades, it was moved to its present location, just a few blocks from there in Bartholdi Park, where it stands as part of the National Botanical Garden. In September of 1876, Bartholdi traveled up to New York City to attend the dedication of yet another of his statues. This one called Lafayette, Arriving in America. And you can see this in Union Square. It's actually one of two Lafayette statues that Bartholdi would create. The second has Lafayette shaking hands with George Washington. And you can see a copy of that statue in another park in Manhattan up around 114th Street. After the dedication, Bartholdi made his very first visit out to Bedloe's Island. He spent the next few months helping to set up fundraising committees in New York, Boston, Philadelphia. In December, he traveled up to Newport, Rhode Island, where he married his fiancee. They took their honeymoon at Niagara Falls, and then at the end of the year, they got to go home to France. But Liberty's Hand and Torch, after the exposition closed, those were moved up to Madison Square in New York City, where they would remain on display until 1882, giving New Yorkers their first glimpse of the statue, first idea of its size, and the hope was that this would interest people in starting to raise money to build that pedestal. Meanwhile, Bartholdi was working on the next part of the statue, which would also debut at a World's Fair, the Universal Exhibition held in Paris in 1878. They charged admission here as well, and about 40 people at a time could climb up inside and look out through the windows in the crown. So now he's got the head, he's got the hand, torch, just has to fill in the rest. Uh, yeah, there were some technical problems yet to solve. This copper, remember, is not going to support its own weight. And the statue is meant to stand on a pedestal on an island in a harbor where it would be subjected to hurricane force winds. So they needed a way to stabilize it. The man who solved both of these problems was a railroad engineer named Alexander Eiffel. He had designed iron railroad bridges and aqueducts around Europe worked on the main exhibition building for an earlier Paris World's Fair, designed a framework for one of the world's first department stores, and just three years after the statue's dedication, would create the world's tallest structure for the 1889 Paris World's Fair. In fact, the Eiffel Tower would remain the tallest man-made structure until 1930, when the Chrysler Building was finished in New York. And we look at it today, and we see one of the world's most popular monuments, draws millions of visitors every year. But when this tower was being built, a lot of people thought it was so ugly, a newspaper cartoon from those years, they wanted it torn down as soon as the exposition closed. The only reason it remained standing was that Eiffel had gotten himself a 20 year lease on it as a tourist attraction. And during those 20 years also tried to show that it could serve some practical purposes. They made weather observations at various heights. Uh, measuring the wind speed and direction and the temperature. Eventually, they put a radio antenna up top. And by the time the 20 years were up, most people had gotten used to it. Some had even started to like it. Just like the American Centennial, technology was a big draw at the 1889 World's Fair. One of the biggest buildings there was called the Hall of Machines. And you could see the latest inventions from around the world. And if you didn't get your fill of technology there, Thomas Edison had his own pavilion on the fairgrounds. You could see his latest electrical work, as well as this new gadget he was introducing called a phonograph. Well, he was very impressed with the Eiffel Tower, rode the elevators to the top more than once. Eiffel actually kept a small apartment on top of the tower during the World's Fair, where he would meet with some of the famous visitors. So for the Statue of Liberty, what Eiffel designed was an iron armature or framework not all that different from the supports for one of his iron railroad bridges. You've got four columns that run through the center of the statue. They're cross-braced for strength, and they support the entire weight of the copper. For stability, those columns are anchored to two sets of enormous I-beams that are set right into the concrete and stone of the pedestal. You can see the anchors as you climb the stairs in the pedestal. 
there's a scale model in the museum showing how all the pieces fit together. And if you climb to the top of the pedestal, you can look through a glass ceiling and you can see the framework surrounding the spiral stairs to the crown. This is as high as visitors can get these days. Um, I was told recently that the island and the pedestal have reopened at least partly, but that the statue itself is still closed. And even for the past 10 years or so, ever since the island reopened after 9-11, the National Park Service has allowed only a few dozen people each hour to climb the stairs to the crown. And that's for safety reasons. So if you have any intention of doing that in the future, you need to get those tickets online, um, sometimes days or even weeks in advance during the more popular ones. Well, as soon as this framework was completed, Bartoldi could get to work assembling the statue. And he did that with temporary rivets right outside the Paris workshop where the copper was being hammered into shape. The statue was completed in 1884 and remained standing in Paris for more than a year, drew thousands of visitors, but that's not really why she stayed there. Fact is, on our side of the Atlantic, work had grown to a halt out on the pedestal. The money ran out. Back in 1877, our Congress had voted to accept the statue as a gift from France, and they agreed at that time that she would stand exactly where Bartholdi wanted her to, in the middle of Fort Wood on Bedloe's Island. The island was named after Isaac Bedloe, Dutch merchant who owned it in the 17th century. And the army built Fort Wood just before the War of 1812. Those walls, 24 feet high, and at the base, they're 20 feet thick. From up above, the fort is shaped like a star with 11 points. It does make it a very picturesque base for the statue, but that's not why the army designed it that way. Their idea was that if anybody tried to storm those walls, they would get caught in a crossfire between the points. Now, 1877 was also when the American Committee was established in New York. Much like the French American Union, this was made up of American business people and wealthy New Yorkers. They had two jobs, select a design for the pedestal, raise the money to build it. Well, they finally agreed on a design. They held a design competition. So they finally made their choice in 1881. Winning design was submitted by a very popular American architect in those days, Richard Morris Hunt. Well known to the men on the committee, he designed Fifth Avenue mansions and Newport cottages, also worked on the Metropolitan Museum of Art, although that wouldn't be completed during his lifetime. He prepared several plans for a pedestal. The committee rejected the first few, but then he came up with something they liked a design based on one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, a giant Egyptian lighthouse called the Pharos of Alexandria, which stood for more than a thousand years before being toppled by earthquakes. Of course, if you're looking at this picture, you may be thinking, that's not really what the pedestal looks like. Well, that's because after selecting this design, the committee asked for two changes. They asked them to make it shorter so that it wouldn't compete with the statue for attention, and they asked them to simplify it so it would be cheaper to build. Their fundraising efforts just not working the way they wanted to. Early on, they got donations from wealthy friends of theirs, including the steel baron, Andrew Carnegie, the Rockefeller family put in some money, the Astor family, P.T. Barnum put in a few hundred dollars. But the committee was well aware that in France, everybody from school children to millionaire industrialists were contributing to the effort to build the statue. And they wanted to see the same kind of response here in the US. But they were having a hard time selling the American public on this project. For one thing, a lot of people around the nation saw this as New York City's monument. Let the New Yorkers pay for it. Classical sculpture was almost unknown in this country at that time. So the statue looked kind of odd to a lot of people. And many just didn't understand what she was meant to represent. The name may not have helped. Bartholdi called the statue Liberty Enlightening the World. And while we think of liberty as another word for freedom, which it is, it comes from a Latin word, libertas. And in the mythology of ancient Rome, libertas was a goddess. That's why the statue wears Roman robes and sandals. Originally worshipped only by freed slaves, libertas later had temples throughout the Roman Empire, 
her face on Roman coins. But for Bartoldi, the name is just the beginning. He always liked to include symbols in his sculptures. So you've got the tablet, which has been a symbol of law since biblical days, but was also meant to represent the documents that our nation was founded on, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution. She holds up the torch, representing the light of freedom, shining for people all around the world. And you might even think of her as leading people to freedom with that light. From certain angles, you can see she is not standing still. She's stepping forward. And they're very difficult to see except from directly above, but she is stepping forward out of broken chains that lay at her feet. In his earliest designs, Bartoldi imagined her holding those broken chains in her left hand. It was Labelle who suggested the tablet instead. Then there's the crown. Bartoldi never really explained the crown, but this is also generally believed to represent that light of freedom, which makes those spikes up there rays of light. And you've got seven of them. So some historians believe that number seven was chosen to represent the world's seven continents, making liberty a more universal symbol of freedom. Might also bring to mind the seven seas or the seven wonders of the ancient world. Back in 2010, the author Yasmin Khan suggested another interpretation in a book called Enlightening the World, the creation of the Statue of Liberty. Suggested a link to early American history which was never far from Labelle's mind, reminds us that our constitution was written in Philadelphia in the summer of 1787. Presiding over the convention was our future president, George Washington, who often sat in that armchair, which you see behind him in the painting. If you go to Philadelphia and visit Independence Hall, they still have that chair on display. It's pretty hard to see here in the painting, but Painted on the back of the chair is a rather stylized sun. So also in attendance for the convention was Labelle's hero, Benjamin Franklin. But Franklin was well along in years and not in good health. Didn't often speak during the convention. When he had something he wanted to contribute, he would write it down, pass it to one of the other delegates to read aloud. But on the last day of the convention, when it seemed that the work was done, when they could look forward to the Constitution being approved by the states, becoming the law of the land, Franklin turned to James Monroe and he said he'd been looking at the sun on Washington's chair and that he was wondering if that sun was rising or setting on our United States. Well, Franklin's conclusion, I have the happiness to know that it is a rising and not a setting sun. So that gives you another way to look at that crown. You can look up there and see Franklin's rising sun. Now, there were people here in the 1870s and 1880s who did appreciate the statue, who did understand what she stood for. Luckily for all of us, one of them was a newspaper editor named Joseph Pulitzer. And you might trace some of his understanding to the fact that he did not grow up with our freedoms. First generation immigrant born in Hungary in 1847, arrived in the United States when he was 17 years old. So 1864, lands in New York, joins the Union Army, rides with the cavalry for the last year of the war. When the fighting ended, he made his way west, landed in St. Louis, Missouri. Because he spoke several languages, he found work there as a reporter for a German language newspaper worked his way up to editor and publisher, saved up his money. And in 1878, he bought the two largest papers in that city, the Post and the Dispatch, combined them into a single paper so he could combine the circulations. And then in 1883, came back east, bought the New York World from Jay Gould, and quickly set about increasing that paper's circulation as well. So successfully that in 1890, had the office building on the left side of this picture built as his headquarters, tallest building in the world at that time, 345 feet. Unfortunately, it was demolished in the 1950s to make room for an automobile ramp to the Brooklyn Bridge. Now, Pulitzer or Pulitzer got a lot of criticism for his newspapers. A lot of people thought they were pure sensationalism, full of scandals and crime stories and cartoons. And all of that's true, but he knew his audience. He was writing and publishing for the working people, for the new immigrants, and he was looking out for them too. 
never stopped looking to expose corruption in business or government. And when he saw what was happening out on Bedloe's Island, or more accurately, what was not happening out on Bedloe's Island, he took up the cause of the Statue of Liberty, wrote editorials about how ungrateful we would look when France sent us this statue and we couldn't even provide a pedestal. And he told his readers, liberty represents freedom for all of you. You can't wait for a handful of millionaires to build her a pedestal. So he promised that he would print in the paper the name of every person who donated, no matter how little they gave. And it worked, those donations poured in. Most of them were less than a dollar, but he kept his word, printed the names of more than 120,000 donors. And finally, the American committee had the money they needed. Like the French American Union, they had underestimated the cost. They thought, or maybe they hoped, they could build that pedestal for about $125,000. Final cost was twice that, or roughly $5 million in today's money. But as soon as the work resumed in New York, Bartoli could begin disassembling the statue in Paris, pulling out those temporary rivets. She broke down to 350 pieces. Those were loaded into more than 200 wooden crates, which were delivered to Bedloe's Island in June of 1885, delivered by a frigate loaned by the French Navy. The crates were then stored on the island until the pedestal was completed in April of 1886. The pedestal itself is 89 feet tall, but it stands on top of a concrete foundation that's 62 feet high. And that foundation is pretty much a solid block of concrete, except for a shaft in the middle for stairs and an elevator. Much like Bartholdi, Richard Morris Hunt liked to include symbols in his architecture. So if you look at the upper part of the pedestal on each side, you've got a row of stone columns, and those might bring to mind the Roman temples dedicated to Libertas, or maybe the architecture of ancient Athens with its early democracy. Each corner of the pedestal, made up of 13 layers of granite, one for each of our original 13 colonies, our first 13 states, and above the doorway on each side. You have this row of 10 round projections. The plan was to decorate each of those with the shield of one of the United States. They include the shield of the District of Columbia, where the capital is located, and you would have had a total of 40. That was not done because once again, the money ran out, and maybe just as well. I think there would be some states feeling a little left out today. When the statue was dedicated, there was nothing inside the pedestal but an iron stairway up to the foot of the statue. They didn't install an elevator in the pedestal until 20 years later. The one you see on the screen was installed in the 1980s. And back in 2012, uh, they made some more improvements to the elevator system so that it's finally possible to reach the observation deck at the top of the pedestal with a wheelchair. In August of 1886, Scientific American Magazine printed this picture on their cover. You can see the completed pedestal. You can see Eiffel's framework on top. The final job will be hanging and riveting together all of the copper. You probably remember back in the 1980s, seeing in the news and on television, the statue was surrounded with scaffolding 300 feet high. Not very much scaffolding back in the 1880s. The workers just climbed out onto that framework to assemble the statue. And they finally started assembling the head the beginning of October, just a few weeks before the dedication. Now there are 25 windows in the crown, but they're not really there. So you can go up and look out at the harbor of the skyline. The windows are there because Bartoldi wanted the statue to serve as a lighthouse. And he imagined putting a lighthouse lamp inside the head so that after dark, those windows would light up like diamonds. But about a month before the dedication, the United States Lighthouse Board decided on a few changes. Instead of a traditional lighthouse lamp, they were going to go with electric arc lights. So they built a generating station on the island. Then they announced that instead of the light being in the head, they want it in the flame. And that flame was never meant to have a light inside, but Bartoli approved a plan to cut two rows of round windows to let the light shine out, which it did, but not very brightly. So over the next two decades, more and more of the copper was cut away and replaced with colored glass until that flame was basically 250 windows. Leaked really badly and the rainwater began rusting the iron supports in the arm. And it was never a very effective lighthouse. Government wanted that light to be seen 25 miles away, but the flame is 300 feet in the air. 
So sailors were complaining that when the fog rolled in, they couldn't even see that light when they were in the harbor. Bartholdi was equally unimpressed. He passed through New York in 1893 on his way out to see the Chicago World's Fair. He complained, the, he compared the light of the flame to a glow worm. So by 1902, the lighthouse service had given up. They removed the statue from the list of active lighthouses and returned her to the care of the army, which maintained her until the 1930s when the National Park Service took over. In the 1980s, as part of the restoration process, a new flame was made based on old drawings and photographs. And instead of putting a light inside this time, the flame was covered with 24 karat gold leaf, donated for that project. They shine floodlights on it, and you can see the reflected light from miles away. Original flame was taken down and sent to California to appear in the 1985 Tournament of Roses Parade, then made its way back across the United States to be installed in the museum around the foot of the foundation. When that museum was built in the early 70s, the plan was to use it as an immigration museum. Well, over the last few years, the National Park Service has built a new museum on Liberty Island outside the walls of the old fort. And this flame has been moved to that new museum to a glass enclosure where you can see it from out on the harbor. Needless to say, I have not done any traveling in the last year and a half, uh, but as soon as I can get back out there, we'd like to take some new photographs and see the new museum, see this in its new home. The older museum was entered through these tall doors, which were installed in the 1980s, and which are decorated with rather stylized symbols of both the construction and the restoration. One of the organizations that tried to help raise money for the pedestal back in the 1880s was the National Academy of Design. Still located in Manhattan today. December of 1883, they held an art exhibit. You could see paintings and drawings by the old masters, along with curiosities from all around the world. They also held an auction. Among the items you could bid on were manuscripts by famous writers of the day, including Mark Twain and Walt Whitman. This is the cover of the catalog. For the interior of the catalog, they asked a popular New York poet and essayist, Emma Lazarus, to write a poem about the statue. You do know she turned them down didn't see any way she could write a poem about a statue, especially one she hadn't even seen yet. Of course, she did soon reconsider. Emma Lazarus came from a Jewish family that had settled in New York before the American Revolution. And as a writer and a speaker here and overseas, she remained very active in Jewish causes. She even taught at a school for Russian Jewish immigrants. And it was thinking about all the immigrants coming to New York that made her reconsider because she realized that as soon as that statue was completed, it would be the first thing you saw when you came into the harbor. In her poem, she calls the Statue of Liberty the New Colossus. And she imagines her calling out to all the nations of the world. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. The poem was printed in the catalog. Her manuscript was sold at the auction, brought in more than any of the other manuscripts that day. The New York City Papers reprinted the poem in 1886 for the dedication. And this plaque was made in 1903, been displayed on Liberty Island ever since. And it is largely because of her poem and especially those last few lines, which Irving Berlin set to music in the 1940s, that the statue has become so associated with immigration. Never Labelais or Bartholdi's original idea, although people have been coming to the Americas for hundreds of years and coming for so many different reasons, whether it was land or opportunity, religious or political freedom, escaping from wars or poverty or famine. Well, the rate of immigration really began to pick up in the 1820s. Sailing across the Atlantic still took between six and 10 weeks, but more and more people were coming every year. And for a long time, each state was responsible for admitting the immigrants who arrived on its shore. Work was, paperwork was done at whatever dock the ship tied up at. And that got to be a problem in New York. 
by the middle of the 19th century, about 70% of the immigrants, say about 150,000 people every year, were landing in New York City and landing at docks all around the city. So to simplify matters, state government decides they will have all the immigrants land at the same spot. The spot they picked? An old fort at the southern tip of Manhattan, built around the same time as Fort Wood and the two forts on Governor's Island, was named after New York State's first governor, George Clinton, so they called it Castle Clinton. But these forts very quickly became obsolete. So by the 1830s, the army had given the fort to the city government. The city leased it to a group of business people who transformed it first into a restaurant and then into a 6,000 seat theater, which they called Castle Garden. This is what it looked like inside in the early 1850s when Jenny Lind, the Swedish opera singer, made her American debut. In 1855, the state government took over Castle Garden and it would serve as the immigrant landing station for the next 35 years, during which about 8 million people passed through there. But it was closed down in 1890 by the new Federal Bureau of Immigration. Supreme Court had finally ruled that immigration should be the responsibility of the federal government rather than the individual states. And by the 1890s, steamships are crossing the Atlantic Ocean in a week or less. Still not an easy voyage for most immigrants who couldn't afford the cabins on a ship like this. They had to travel the cheapest way possible, it's called steerage class. Traveled below the decks of the ship, might not see much sunlight or breathe much fresh air from the time you left Europe until you stepped ashore here in the United States. But these ships were soon bringing half a million people to New York every year. And the Bureau had a big problem with Castle Garden. It was right there in the city what's now Battery Park. As soon as you left the station, you were out on the city streets. And a lot of these newcomers were running into trouble with swindlers and pickpockets. So the Bureau decided that they would build a station on one of the harbor islands. They just didn't have much left to choose from. The army had two forts out on Governor's Island. They weren't going anywhere. Nobody really thought the station should be on Bedloe's Island next to the statue. So the Bureau was left with the very smallest island, barely three acres, barely above water at high tide. Well, they enlarged it and raised it with landfill. And in 1892, Ellis Island opened up. If it doesn't look familiar to you, well, the entire station was built of wood. And just five years later, burned to the ground. Fortunately, the fire broke out in the middle of the night, so nobody was injured or killed but many of the records from Castle Garden were being stored out there and were lost in the blaze. So for the next few years, immigrants once again had to land at the Battery. The old fort was later transformed into the New York City Aquarium, which served that purpose up until the early 1940s when it was closed down, later to reopen on the Coney Island boardwalk. The fort was finally partly restored in the 1970s, renamed Castle Clinton, and its national monument, centerpiece of Battery Park. And inside is where you get the tickets for the ferries running from Manhattan out to Liberty and Ellis Islands. Learning from their mistake, the Bureau made the new buildings on Ellis Island fireproof, built them of steel and brick and stone. The main building here is actually larger than the original island. And this one opened up on December 17, 1900. Four ships landed that day. Between them, they brought 2,000 immigrants. And the numbers were still climbing. By 1907, a million people a year were arriving in New York City, sometimes more than 10,000 in a single day. Those were the days you had to wait for hours in the Great Hall to be interviewed, to be inspected by doctors. Those doctors had about two minutes a person to decide if you were fit to come in. Most people were admitted. And because people were coming from so many different nations, many of them speaking little or no English, one of the most important jobs you could do on Ellis Island was serve as an interpreter. And one of those early 20th century interpreters was later elected mayor of New York City, Fiero LaGuardia. He spoke English and Hebrew, also Croatian, German, Hungarian, Italian, and Yiddish. He could answer questions in those languages, learn to give short speeches in them, 
So not only a very valuable employee on Ellis Island, but later a very popular politician with the city's many new immigrants. Some of the people who landed on Ellis Island had to spend a few days or even a few weeks in one of the island's hospitals, recovering from the voyage or from infectious diseases. But most people were able to go straight to the ferry docks to begin their new lives here. For several decades, you had a ferry called the Ellis Island, which ran back and forth between Ellis and Manhattan. During the busiest years, it was in operation 18 hours a day. Even so, most of the people who landed at Ellis Island were not planning on remaining in New York City or even the metropolitan area. They took other ferries to the New Jersey waterfront where you had enormous railroad stations in Hoboken. This one was in Jersey City. From there, you could get to every part of the United States. This was the terminal built by the Central Railroad of New Jersey in 1886. Ellis Island remained very busy up until the start of the First World War. During the war, German submarines made crossing the Atlantic a little too dangerous. The numbers started to climb again after the war, but then in the 1920s, our Congress passed a series of what they called quota laws, limiting the number of people from each nation that would be admitted each year. And those numbers got smaller year by year, so that by the end of the decade, the total was back down to 150,000 each year. It was also during these years, little by little, most of the screening was being moved overseas as people applied for their visas. So eventually the only people who had to land at Ellis Island were those who needed to be detained for either legal or medical reasons. Altogether, about 15 million people passed through Ellis Island before the government closed it down in 1955. Locked up the buildings, they sat empty for decades. There was talk of transforming some of them to serve as a school or a hospital, even housing. One architect recommended tearing the roofs off all of the buildings to create picturesque ruins. Frank Lloyd Wright thought they should be knocked down completely, making way for what he called a perfect city of the future. Guess who he thought would win that commission? Well, neither of those plans were adopted because in 1965, President Lyndon Johnson made Ellis Island part of the Statue of Liberty National Monument. National Park Service began giving limited tours of the island in the late 70s, began restoring the main building in the late 1980s, and that building opened up to the public in the 19, in 1990 as an immigration museum. Over the years, there's been a nonprofit organization working alongside the National Park Service. They call themselves Save Ellis Island, they restored that ferry building I showed a few slides back. They've also patched up the roofs of all of the buildings and stabilized them. And the plan coming years is to open more and more of the island to visitors. Well, I've got just one last story to tell you. And it's about a man who visited Liberty Island back in 1957. His name was Morris Pesson. He lived in Jersey City, decided to bring his wife and children out to see the statue. But in those days, the only ferries left from Battery Park in Lower Manhattan. So they had to drive through the Holland Tunnel, got stuck in the summer traffic jams. From Jersey City to Liberty Island, the trip took them about three hours. When they arrived, Morris Pesson noticed two things. First of all, Liberty Island was a lot closer to Jersey City than it was to Battery Park. Second thing he noticed, his hometown waterfront was not much of a backdrop for a national monument. It was lined with old factories and warehouses and docks and piers, some of those already abandoned and falling into ruin. Another 10 years, even the great railroad stations would be closed down. But Mr. Pesson was just the person to do something about this. He was a lawyer, he had fought for civil rights, involved in all kinds of local causes, and he understood the value of publicity. The following summer, he invited a group of reporters to meet him on the Jersey City waterfront. There, he got into a rented canoe and rowed himself out to Liberty Island. That took all of eight minutes. Now he had their attention and he explained his plan. He wanted to build a bridge from Jersey City to Liberty Island. Well, the bridge never got built, but with all of his publicity, he was able to attract other activists and supporters and get the first donations of money and land. Jersey City turned over the first section of land on the waterfront 
So they were able to clear away some of those old factories and warehouses, tear down or rebuild the piers. Until finally, on Flag Day, June 14th, 1976, the first small section of Liberty State Park opened to the public. Opened up as a work in progress, still a work in progress, but it's grown a lot over the years. Walking trails, ball fields, monuments, Liberty Science Center, restaurants and marinas, great views of the New York City and Jersey City skylines. And it's also where you can catch the ferries running from New Jersey out to Liberty and Ellis Islands. That brings us to the end of our look at the statue's history. If you visit my website, which is simply kevinweiss.com, you will find a full schedule of when I'm speaking and which topics I'll be speaking about, even occasionally where I'll be speaking. Although for the rest of the year, most of my talks will continue to be online like this one. You can also follow me online at, on Facebook at Kevin Weiss Author or Instagram at Kevin Weiss. And on the website, you can find links and information for the regional history books I've written, including Liberty, an illustrated history of America's favorite statue. I've written a couple of books about my own state of New Jersey, including Jersey Shore History and Facts and New Jersey State Parks. And for anybody who's getting tired of the heat wave, I've got a book out called Santa's Hometown, which is all about some of our favorite Christmas traditions. You can find these and others in either paperback or ebook editions on Barnes & Noble or Amazon. I'd like to thank everybody for logging in and watching this evening. If you've got any questions, be glad to do my best to try to answer those. Um, you will have to unmute your own microphones. Can't do that from our end. Did we have any questions? Thanks. Thanks so much, Kevin. So, well, someone oh, had a question um, <laughs> asking, because they had missed the opening of the presentation. They wanted to know if they could, how they could view it. So, yes, this is being recorded and we will have it up on our YouTube channel um, probably sometime next week. Uh, I actually had a question. Um, I was overwhelmed by the story about the um, iron and copper reaction and what an undertaking to replace all that iron with the stainless steel. How, how long was the restoration process? Uh, well, the statue's 100th anniversary was in 1986. Um, I don't know how long that step of the process took, but the whole restoration effort went on for probably a good four years or so. And was it done through fundraising or the, or the park? Uh, fundraising and the park service. Lee Iacocca was one of the people who helped raise a lot of the funds for it, led the fundraising efforts in those days for both Liberty and Ellis Islands. Mm -hmm. Was there any other questions? If not, then we will let Kevin go. <laughs> and uh, thank you all for coming tonight. For tuning in and I think Kevin, thank you so much for doing this presentation. Oh. I'm sure we'll be looking at your website and see, getting another presentation here, probably in the winter. Well, thanks for having me. Okay, good night, everyone. <laughs>